So welcome everyone to the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts General Operating Support for Organizations uh, workshop where we walk through the application itself for the program. This is for the April 3rd, 2023 deadline. My name is Todd Trebor. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am the Organizations Program Director at RISCA and the 504 Accessibility Coordinator. As Organizations Program Director, I'm responsible for the needs uh, of the organizations within our arts and culture ecosystem. I manage grant programs to uh, serve that portion of the ecosystem uh, and just basically do whatever you all need. I meet with people on a regular basis, see where their shared needs and develop programs based on those shared needs, convene people together for the sake of advocacy purposes, et cetera, et cetera. It's fun. And I manage this grant program you're learning more about today. So I'm gonna go over first, just some basics about the general operating support for organizations grant program. Everything I'm sharing with you today before we get to the application walkthrough is available in the grant guidelines as well. So the general operating support for organizations program provides multi-year unrestricted operating support to arts and culture organizations and culturally specific organizations across Rhode Island that meaningfully engage and inspire their communities through arts and culture programming. So this program used to be called Investments in Arts and Culture. Uh, this program, the Investments in Arts and Culture program was restructured in collaboration with a working group between May and October of 2020. The working group consisted of 36 people from 22 Rhode Island-based arts and culture organizations from around the state who varied in size, kinds of communities engaged, artistic disciplines and cultural traditions that they amplified or, or, or program within. Organizations represented in that working group included organizations that were in the prior general operating support program called Investments in Arts and Culture, as well as members of the Rhode Island Expansion Arts Program, which is a collaborative program that RISCA manages uh, in partnership with the Humanities Council and the Rhode Island Foundation that supports communities that are led by and deeply engaged communities of, sorry, organizations that are led by and deeply engaged communities of color uh, through a three-year capacity building program. The working group worked together to develop these goals and uh, all the major pieces of architecture for this program as well, program features, um, evaluation criteria, et cetera. So goals for this program are to provide multi-year unrestricted operating support for arts and culture organizations and culturally specific organizations throughout the state through a competitive grant program. The goal is also, second goal is to include organizations that are evaluated by peer review panels as being responsive and accountable to the needs of their identified communities. The asterisks that you see throughout this presentation relate to terms in the glossary that you can see in both the guidelines for this program and the application as well. I will go over a few of those terms in the course of this workshop or presentation or application walkthrough, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, third goal, through extensive recruitment and a streamlined entrance process, uh, includes organizations that better represent the diversity of state along the following parameters. Uh, racial, at uh, the time when this new program was started, only five BIPOC-centered organizations were in it in 2020. RISCA has set a goal of at least 10 BIPOC-centered organizations in the program by 2025. I'll be reviewing the definition of BIPOC-centered later on. Uh, interestingly enough, at our 2022 deadline, we uh, the panels chose to um, allow or accept 11 uh, BIPOC-centered organizations into this program. So we've already blown past that goal, and we'll just keep on blowing past it. Uh, geographic, there are towns and communities that have no organizational representation in the General Operating Support for Organizations program. RISC has set a goal of including at least three organizations from three different unrepresented towns or cities in the GOSO program by 2025. At the last application deadline, the first for this new program, we had one uh, new uh, municipality represented in the general operating support program, which is very exciting. So we're on our way to meeting our 2025 goal there as well. The geographies that fit, uh, you can see uh, in the guidelines for this program, in the print guidelines, what towns and cities we have represented in the program currently. Fourth goal, provide a just and equitable distribution of funding 
that helps address the damage done by generations of institutional racism. For this goal to be realized, additional funding consideration will be given to organizations that represent historically and continuously marginalized communities or constituencies in their mission, programming, staff, and board. In this specific context, historically and continuously marginalized communities may include, but are not limited to, BIPOC communities. Uh, you see the listing there of what is included in that definition, uh, as well as organizations that are led by engaged people with disabilities and others who can make, make the case for being historically and continuously marginalized. So getting into some brass tacks here, the deadlines for this program. So this deadline, the April 3rd, 2023 deadline at 11.59 p.m. is for organizations with average annual budgets over a half million dollars a year that are up for reapplication. Also eligible to apply at this deadline are organizations who became eligible for the program last fiscal year, regardless of budget size. Just so you all know what the future reapplication schedule is, next year, the April 1st, 2024 deadline will be reapplication for organizations whose budgets are annual, average annual budgets are between $100,000 and $500,000 a year. And the year following that in 2025 will be for organizations whose average annual budgets are under $100,000 a year. In the summer of 2025, a BIPOC majority working group will be uh, convened to reevaluate this program, assessing whether or not it's achieving its goals and making modifications to it within its current structure and framework. Not included on this slide is that in 2030, this entire program will be reevaluated and restructured again. So it is responsive and relevant to the arts and culture ecosystem and the moment of time we're in culturally at this point in time, at that point in time, I should say. Uh, I bring this up because the prior, uh, when we did the restructure for the general operating support program in 2020, it had not been touched for about 20 years. And we want to ensure that we bake into our guidelines um, a schedule and methodology for ensuring that our programs are continuously evaluated and continuously relevant. For the sake of determining which deadline I reapply at, for those of you who are reapplying, and this might will be relevant to you all when you apply or reapply in the future, uh, what my grant award could be and how do I calculate my annual budget. So budget size for determining application and grant awards will be based on the three-year average of your organization's total expenses listed in your 990s from 2019, 2020, and 2021 fiscal years. If your organization files a 990EZ, this is your total cash expenses that would be on the first page of your 990, part one, line 17. And if your organization files a standard 990, this would be your cash expenses listed on the first page of your 990, line one, part, sorry, part one, line 18. So who is eligible to apply? New applicants apply in the year in which they become eligible to the program. Again, I'm gonna go over that and what that means in a minute in a slide or two from here. And then they reapply when their budget cohort is up for, for reapplication. Eligible to apply are nonprofit arts and culture organizations or culturally specific organizations. Organizations can be fiscally sponsored, meaning an organization does not need to be a nonprofit and can be eligible to apply for this program if their budget is under $50,000 a year and they have a nonprofit that functions as a fiscal sponsor for them. If you have more questions about that, I can answer that in the questions so far slide that will be coming up in just a little bit, or you can just email me about that as well. Semi-independent cultural entities uh, that are either one, associated with a university, or two, a subdivision of a larger nonprofit are also eligible if they meet the following eligibility criteria. They manage their own budget. They have at least one full-time position uh, dedicated solely to the operation of that entity. And they have an advisory board that meets regularly to discuss policy, policy strategic direction, and resource development plans to ensure long-term sustainability. Other considerations is having arts and culture stated as a central part of your organization's mission, being in continuous operation or and exhibiting or producing arts and culture programming 
for each year of the past five years. It is understood that some organizations are going to be seasonal in nature with the work that they do, but there is a sense that they need to have been continually operating and programming for five years. Presenting programming in ADA accessible spaces, uh, which some of us for shorthand refer to as wheelchair accessible spaces. Uh, for new applicants, you become eligible by fitting all those criteria right or some constellation of them. Uh, and then you have to also have received high scores in the Project Grants for Organizations program or the Project Grant and Educations program. Um, that's in the case of, again, I would say read the guidelines there. There are specifics around that and what that means. Um, we say high scores. If you receive a grant award, that is the equivalent of getting a high score, right? But we have the high score piece in there because these programs have become increasingly competitive over time. And we essentially uh, don't want to exclude organizations that are doing great, that panels like the work that they're doing, but they just might not be getting grant awards because we have limited funds and a massive amount of applications to these programs. Other things to know, this is a competitive program. This was not a competitive program in its prior iteration. Not everyone that applies is going to get a grant. Funds are limited. Our grants budget has not increased for general operating support in years. Um, so we're just, we're, we're having to work with the money that we have, right? Uh, panel representation requirements for you all to be aware of. As with all of risk of grant programs, there are uh, panels of people convened to evaluate applications. With all of our other grant programs, these individuals are always Rhode Island residents. With this grant program, it is a mix. Uh, we have, we recruit people who are residents of Rhode Island, two to three, but we also recruit people who live outside of Rhode Island for this program, two to three individuals. Uh, what we look for, we have general panel requirements, panel representation requirements. Those general requirements for our panels are that at least two individuals have to be BIPOC identifying, and at least one individual has to be a practicing artist. For this program, we also look for individuals who have had experience managing, working at, running organizations of similar sizes and similar ilks to those being evaluated within the grant program in that given year. We also recruit people who work in similar positions to mine and my colleagues who essentially work at a uh, ecosystem, a higher ecosystem level uh, in the arts and culture um, universe within the country. Uh, you know, work at state arts agencies, work at other grant making institutions, have a sense of what the field is nationally and can give organizations being evaluated in the general operating support program feedback on what they're doing and how they're doing um, and suggestions for improving the work they're doing based on their knowledge of what's happening in the field broadly. GOSO grantees are ineligible to apply for or receive funding from any other group grant program during their grant award period again. Those grant award periods are typically three years. We the exception of the culture facilities grant program when we have that available. And then temporary grant programs that explicitly state that GOSO recipients are eligible. Most recently, that was our Build the Future grant program that fit that definition, uh, which was supported by American Rescue Plan Act funds and supported organizations, uh, creative workforce development programs. If you receive a grant, you must credit RISCA on all your marketing materials. All risk of grants are always contingent upon the availability of funds. We make these grant awards, um, we make these grant decisions, I should say, uh, before we're fully sure of what the state budget is for the fiscal year in which the grant awards themselves are made. And many of you have experienced this with our April 1st deadline. In this case, it's April 3rd because the first falls on a weekend day uh, that we can't make grant award announcements until the state budget passes for the upcoming fiscal year that starts on July 1st. Sometimes the state budget is passed at the end of June. Sometimes it's not passed until late August. We can't make a grant award announcement until the budget's passed for any of our programs, for anyone applying at the April 3rd, 2023 deadline in this case. You'll receive notification, as I just mentioned, after the state budget passes, usually about a week after. Payments can take for all of our grant programs anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. The Great Resignation has deeply affected Rhode Island state government and has deeply affected the speed at which we were able to process payments. 
We do not process payments in our office. You can always ask us about your grant payments, but just know our information is limited and our um, our degree of control over the speed of your, your uh, grant payments is also deeply limited. Uh, there is a requirement with all of our grant programs that the work occur in ADA compliant spaces. That's a requirement of general operating support for organizations for sure. And if you are a grantee in this program, you have to submit a brief final report to RISCA online. Um, let's say you annually. So again, this is a three-year grant program. There is always an annual uh, final report due by July 31st of each year. This brief final grant report is a series of quantitative questions that many of you are familiar with if you've done risk of grants before. The narrative questions that used to be a part of this final report for this program have now been replaced by having a 60-minute meeting with me. These meetings will typically happen in the spring, and they are not evaluative meetings. They're conversations. They let me and us know how you all are doing, what challenges you're facing, and how we can be helpful. And they're super fun. How are grant awards determined? I promise there's a question so far, slide coming up soon. Go so applicants do not request specific grant award amounts. Rather, they're determined by the following factors. Panel ranking and funding recommendation. Organization's average annual operating budget. If an organization represents historically, we actually took out the or, and I didn't take it off of the slide, historically and continuously marginalized communities or constituencies in their mission, staff, programming, and board. Uh, and lastly, the amount of funds allocated for organal, organizational support by RISCA and by the state. The award amounts and ranges listed on the next slide and also on the slide following uh, this next slide that's coming up are estimated. And they're always going to be estimated because we're assuming what our budget will be for the next fiscal year for this grant program. And it always could change. So you can see there. T grant awards. Things to note is that uh, there are award ranges, right? What will happen is a panel is going to evaluate the applicants to um, this program. They'll discuss each application and they will rank them and score them. At the end of their discussions, at the end of the day, when they meet, they meet in person for a day, uh, in person via Zoom. Uh, they will see their rankings uh, presented to them in a Zoom screen like this on an Excel spreadsheet in descending order by rank score, and then they're going to make grant award determinations there. If they determine that an organization has scored high enough to receive a grant award, the default grant award for that organization is going to be the middle award listed in that middle column. They have the option for organizations that score high to recommend an organization for the highest grant award possible in that award range. If they do that, they have to then recommend a low scoring organization for the lowest possible score in their award range. This is because, as I mentioned, this grants budget has not grown and doesn't look like it's going to grow in the near future. Who knows? Um, so we have to work with the money we have. So they also have to follow their rankings in that, meaning they have to take a top scoring organization. They can't choose one further down the column to, re to receive a larger grant award. And if they do that, again, they would choose to give an organization a high scoring, a high award based on their score. They need to choose an organization that scored at the bottom to receive the uh, smallest award possible in that range. So as an example, and just to maybe over speak this, over communicate this, for this cycle, let's say my organization has a budget between a average annual budget, I should say, between a half million dollars and one million dollars. And I, uh, the panel's discussing my application. I score high enough that they deem that my organization should receive an award. The default award I receive would receive is fifteen, sorry, twelve thousand five hundred dollars. If my organization scored high, was a top scoring organization they could elect to recommend that my organization receive $17,000, the top amount possible in uh, for my particular organization size. I can answer questions about that when we get to the questions section. So as mentioned there in goal four, um, part of the working group's interest was accounting for the uh, systemic 
uh, racial inequity and how it's impacted our world and certainly the arts and culture ecosystem with the idea of giving additional funding consideration with or to organizations that have historically and continuously marginalized individuals and communities uh, in their board, staff, uh, mission and leadership, et cetera. So we had the individuals that were BIPOC identifying and were part of our working group um, develop this definition for what it meant to be a BIPOC-centered organization. So one way in which uh, this, this goal is manifesting is in supporting BIPOC-centered organizations. A BIPOC-centered organization is an organization with a mission and programming that's explicitly reflective of a community or communities of color where the board, staff, artists, and collaborators include a significant representation of that community. The following organizational characteristics need to be met in order to fit this definition. That the primary mission, intentions, and practices are by, for, and about uh, art heritages, cultures, and communities of color. That the executive leader is a, a BIPOC identifying individual. That at least 60% of the board and 60% of the staff separately uh, are BIPOC identifying individuals. Uh, organizations self attest to fitting that definition, but then uh, risk of staff will review your application to ensure that is indeed the case uh, and will ask for more information as needed. And again, I'll answer more questions about that when we get to a question slide. So how grant awards are determined for these organizations as well as disability centered organizations who are still developing that particular definition. Uh, essentially, you'll see the grant award ranges. I mean, you'll see, I'll, I'll tell you because it's tricky to see. Um, these ranges are one and a half times larger than the grant award ranges you saw on the previous slide. And you can see that this definition only has impacts for organizations whose budgets are under a million dollars. This was also a desire of that particular working group I identified in the prior slide as well. Hold on, I need to let some people into the room. All right, so I'm gonna pause the recording. Give me one second, y'all. And then you can ask any questions you might have. And hold on one second, it's giving me some problems here. All right, getting into just starting your application and things that you need to gather. So first and foremost, a lot of these things you're like, oh yeah, we know this. We've applied for RISCO organizational grants before. You're gonna want a 501c3 determination letter. This is required for us in order to grant out uh, federal resource funds. We have to grant them out to nonprofit organizations. It's a requirement. Uh, SAM UEI, which is a stands for Federal System of Awards Management Unique Entity Identifier. Um, if you haven't received one of those, uh, you'll need to request one. There's information on the RISCA website as to how to do so. I will share that in the link that will be emailed to you all as well after this uh, workshop. Um, it's again, a requirement from the federal government for anyone who receives federal resource funds. You're gonna want your FY19, uh, 2020 and 2021 990. You'll need to submit those as a part of the application. If you don't have your 21, 2021 990 done, you'll need to get it done. Um, you'll also need a board approved budget from your current and most recently completed fiscal year. This can be provided in whatever format makes sense. This is, so, all of these things I'm just sharing on this slide are, are all compliance related, right? When I talk about evaluation criteria, you will see that we are not having as a part of our assessment anything about anyone's financials per se. Um, so these are all compliance related. The 990s also serve as a means of us determining grant award uh, amounts because the funding formula as described bases grant awards partially on the size of an organization's annual budget average annual budget. Other things to gather, and I'm telling people like, these are the things you wanna do at the beginning, because what I always hear is people start this the last week and they run around emailing me, freaking out because they don't have these things. Just start doing these things now. So support materials from the last three years that show how your organization's work is meaningful to your communities. This can be anything in the voice of community members outside your organization. Um, meaning people who don't work there, right? Could be students, uh, clients, uh, audience members, right? Letters of support or a document that simply captures their reactions to things that you've done or things that are valuable to them about what your organization does. 
community partners inside or outside the art sector is something that um, the panels are going to be looking for to right? Um, they want to see a diversity of support for your organization within a community because that speaks to its relevancy in that community as well. For, organ for all the organizations that are reapplying this year, you can, and I, this was something that came up in a feedback session, because you just applied last year, you can reuse things that you feel are helpful and meaningful. I'm going to let the panel know that it's fine if these letters of support or other materials are from, you know, the past, you know, 18 months or so. Okay. Support material gathered from the last year that just shows the cultural program that the organization does as well. You can submit up to four of those. And again, for reapplying organizations, it is fine to use the same thing. Different panel, right? None of these people on this panel will have seen these things before or know who you are uh, outside of maybe knowing who you are for other reasons. These two uh, current list of board members, um, if applicants are using fiscal sponsors in general this cycle, they can reach out to me. I'm pretty sure there's not an eligible organization that's using a fiscal sponsor this cycle. That current list of board members, we just need the list. You don't need to go add any other information. If you have other information there, because that's how you typically submit a board list for a grant, that's fine. This is a compliance thing, all right? We just need to know that, you're, that your organization has a board uh, of individuals that is stewarding the work that you're doing. And then a board and staff demographics chart. This chart is available within the application for your organization's budget size, all right? I'll talk a bit more about that later on, but there are two applications this deadline application for the organizations whose budgets are over a half million and ones whose budgets are under a half million. All right, I'm going to pause there the recording and answer any questions. Right. So I'm going to talk about the evaluation criteria now for this program. So at risk, we believe that organizations and the general operating support for organizations program display artistic excellence and merit through their artistic vibrancy and relevancy. This is going to make more sense in the next slide. For RISCA, artistic excellence and merit will be measured against the artistic vibrancy and relevancy criteria listed on the general operating support for organizations rubric. I'm not going to go into depth about that rubric, but that rubric is available on the guidelines webpage for this program. It's also available within the grant applications for this program as well. The reason why this slide exists is because the NEA requires that we incorporate artistic merit and excellence as a, a part of our uh, review criteria. Our working group chose to interpret that to mean artistic relevancy and vibrancy. State arts agencies are allowed to define what they mean by artistic excellence and merit, and that is what the working group chose to do is define it as artistic vibrancy and relevancy. So half of your uh, your application score is artistic vibrancy and relevancy. Um, hold on a second to just, ah, there we go. So the main question we're asking the panelists here is, is there evidence that the organization meaningfully engages and inspires its community through arts and culture in order to achieve its mission? So that its core programming is strongly related to the organization's mission and their defined organizational community. I'll talk about what that means in a future slide that they demonstrate a complete and thorough understanding of their geographic community and organization in which they're based or which they largely program, that they're able to clearly articulate who the audience or communities they engage with are through their programming, including data or other information sources. They explain how this relate, how they, oh, excuse me, explain how who they engage relates to their mission, that the needs, desires, and identities of their organizational communities are reflected in the organization's artistic and cultural programming, and that community support materials, as I mentioned before, come from a varied array of community sectors, both arts and non-arts, and reflect a robust support for the organization. The rubric I mentioned that's available on the webpage for this program and within the application itself, in that rubric, you will see that for each of these sub-criteria, so the bullets here, it is indicated what application questions speak to those criteria. This was something that the panelists asked for as a easier way of them connecting the dots in their evaluation, but we also thought it would be valuable for uh, applicants as well. 
Um, the information in our workshop like this is the same information we give our panelists as well. We give everyone the same information for clarity and transparency and consistency's sake. 30% of your organization score will be organizational responsiveness and ingenuity. So is there evidence that the organization effectively manages resources, plans, evaluates, and pivots in dialogue with their defined organizational community with leadership reflective of that community? So has a does this organization have a board that is reflective of their organizational community and its diversity and is proactively engaging in efforts to ensure that it's sustained? Are the needs of their organizational community reflected in their operations? And are they working in dialogue with their organizational community to negotiate a recent challenge or opportunity? There's a question about that. And then lastly, commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. That there is representation of staff at a variety of levels. Artists and key collaborators include those in the community who have been historically and continuously marginalized and unrepresented, underrepresented in both their public facing programming and administrative work. You can see a listed list there of what we mean when we say historically and continuously marginalized communities. We use the term historically and continuously marginalized in lieu of what the NEA uses, which is underserved, um, but they are the same federally defined groups. Uh, engaging in meaningful actions to ensure representation within from historically and continuously marginalized communities that is commensurate with where an organization is at in those efforts, as well as their staff size and resources. And then example actions shared within the application are substantive and reflect the organization's DEIA goals or priorities. So some of the definitions I flew by there, again, there's a glossary on the webpage for this program, as well as within the application itself, just checking time here. Um, organizational community, uh, we define as the people who comprise the audiences or communities your organization engages through their programming. This can include audience members, artists, students, and other groups that are significant to the organization. And descriptions could include demographic and geographic makeup including information about relevant socioeconomic factors, as well as diversity of age, ethnicity, race, gender, ability, education, et cetera. This has been a change slightly to this definition um, based on feedback we received from applicants at the last cycle. And then geographic community, the people who live in the place, be it a neighborhood, town, or city in which your organization is physically located, as well as the geography and character of the place. If your organization doesn't have a physical location, this would be the place that it most frequently programs. Descriptions could include demographic and geographic makeup, uh, other information that's relevant about the individuals in your community, the people there, I should say. You can also include descriptions of geography and the character, uh, relevant history, physical features, et cetera, of your geographic community as well. The real focus, and we'll get into this when we get into the application, is essentially who is this organization's defined community, their organizational community. But in order to understand that, particularly for panels, they wanna understand the place that you inhabit. So describing the geographic community is a way for panels to see how well you know where you are and also to uh, educate them about where you are uh, and why and, 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 and um, by doing so that informs the relationship for them between geographic and organizational community. But you'll see, again, organizational community is the thing that comes up a lot in this application. All right, one second. All right, we are indeed walking through the application. So I'm going to pause yet again, because I'm going to uh, unshare the screen and then reshare the application screen. Just give me a moment, everyone. <laughs> Come on now. There we go. Ah, uh, I should have done that earlier, but it's okay. I didn't say a lot that was missing. One second, everyone. All right, here we are at the application. So uh, this is using a, an account I made up for my dog, Amelia Knorr, which is a combination of my and my partner's last names um, for the Amelia Knorr Theater Company. Um, 
So like I said, if you're applying or reapplying, you receive an access code and instructions on how to access this application from our grants portal. This is what the application looks like here. So we've put it into hopefully user-friendly sections. Application overview at the top, this tells you and just breaks down what the application is here. For those of you who have budgets over a half million who are applying this year, you have a separate application and different, slightly very subtly different application from organizations whose budgets are under a half million dollars and vice versa. I'm gonna be focusing on just the application for organizations with budgets over a half million dollars. Um, there's only one question that's subtly different and it's one in the commitment to DEIA uh, section. And you'll just note that language difference when you're answering it yourselves. Um, anyway, and you can ask me questions about that when you get to it if you're an organization uh, that's budgets under a half million. <clears throat> Second section, oh, sorry. So three sections to the application. One is just an eligibility quiz um, where you answer those questions about um, your organization's budget class and just the various questions we must ask you uh, in terms of eligibility. You know, many of you, you know, you've, you've received the password and been invited to apply to this program because you fit the eligibility criteria. So just know that you're, you're probably good to go unless something radical has changed. Uh, and then there's a section that's information for the panel where you tell the panel making funding recommendations for this grant program about your organization. And then there's information for the risk of staff where you share additional information that we're required to collect by the NEA, or as I mentioned, things that we're, we request for compliance purposes as a agency granting out state and federal funds uh, that come from taxpayers. Second section is linked to uh, templates and other resources. First off, the guidelines for this program. Uh, the board and staff demographics chart you'll see there's different charts for uh, organizations of different sizes, understanding that staffing looks different at organizations of different sizes. Uh, and then an evaluation rubric that is for your reference that the panel will be using and also be oriented to use in their work evaluating your applications. After that, we put the glossary at the, as a third section here for you to refer to. Any term that's defined in the glossary has an asterisk next to it. Uh, these this glossary was um, built upon or developed uh, based on the work that our colleagues, the City of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, as well as grant makers in the arts did, particularly when it comes to defining uh, BIPOC-centered organizations, um, but also some of their other definitions, particularly from the City of Seattle, were super helpful, and we did some modification to to fit our particular circumstance. So the eligibility quiz, remember that's section one. This is where you put in uh, the particular information from your Form 990 for your fiscal years 2019, 2020, and 2021, all right? And then you give me the average. You'll also be uploading these 990s later on in the application. Again, this is an accountability, uh, sorry, a compliance thing. Um, and then I kind of also double check your numbers there uh, to make sure they line up. One thing that has been a point of confusion, really the, the form, that you're filing your 990 on might have a different year on it than your fiscal year. So it could be for you that your fiscal year 2019, 990 has 2018 on it. It just depends on when your fiscal year falls and what particular form is available in that fiscal year. So don't worry about that. Just, just really focus on, okay, this is from our fiscal year that ended in, in February of 2019. That's the important thing, right? And if you have questions about that as you're doing it, just ask me, okay? Then you're gonna just answer these questions about whether or not you're an arts and culture or culturally specific organization, you know, that you're a nonprofit. Um, if you're not a nonprofit and you have a fiscal sponsor, there's a, an additional layer there. Again, I'm not aware of any organization that's eligible to reapply or to apply or reapply this year that fits that definition, but reach out if you have a question about that, that your organization is presenting in an ABA compliant space and that you've been operating for five years. That's that section, pretty straightforward. So now information for the panel. At the top of this section here, you see that we just define and describe um, the panel and how it's composed. Again, with this program, we have anywhere between two and three individuals on a five-person panel that come from out of state. 
Here in this first part, you're giving just some basic information, your organization's name, what your mission is. Uh, we have space just in the mission question to for you to talk about any kind of change in mission you might have had in the past few years, as that was relevant to some organizations uh, during and through the pandemic, right? Uh, the next question is introducing your organization, where you introduce your organization to the panel. Um, this gives a panel context about who your organization is and what they do. You also provide a snapshot of staffing structure, including number of staff, artists, independent contractors employed. This question, we uh, increase the character count a fair amount, thanks to feedback, um, because this is really the, the question that um, orients the panel as to who your organization are, is and what they do, et cetera. You have the option, if it's just easier, uh, to talk about your staffing structure by upflowing, sorry, uploading a flow chart there. You can see there's that organizational chart option. These questions, for the most part, are not something the panel is evaluating on, with the exception of, and you'll see this in the rubric, a sense of like, okay, what's their core programming? Does it relate to their mission? And then that then informs some questions later on about does their program or programming and mission relate to their defined organizational community. You'll submit uh, four support materials as described earlier from the last three years that show your artistic and cultural programming that your organization does. Impact of the pandemic. Uh, in what ways has the pandemic impacted your organization? How does it continue to impact your organization? You can see there, and, and I wanted to say this for all applicants, for this program and any of our programs, the sub questions, the, the description of the questions is as important as a question in bold. Really answer these questions directly because particularly, um, it's true with this grant program, I saw it last cycle and I see it a lot with pro project grants for organizations. What gets in people's way is they don't answer the questions. If you just answer the questions and don't answer around the questions, you're like halfway there, right? Or more than halfway there. So there's nothing in the rubric that addresses this question. This is to give the panel context, because for some of you, you might be in a weird spot about talking about what you typically do, and then some of those things are different or they're in flux, and we want them to have that context. You're not evaluated on this question. It's also for us as staff uh, and, and people at risk to understand uh, how the impact, the pandemic is impacting you all. Um, obviously, I get those sense through conversations and the annual meetings I have as well, but this is another chance for us to hear that. Um, excuse me. The next question, number four, organizational support materials. You remember this? This is things that come from, excuse me. Sorry, yes, these are things that speak to the artistic and cultural programming of your organization. Up to four of those can be provided. Number five. You're going to describe your geographic community, so the community your organization is located in. If your organization does not have a physical location, the geographic community in which your organization most regularly programs. Uh, we're asking for you all to include the demographics of that community in your response. For some of you all, this might be a bit complex. It could be that your geographic community is the whole state. Uh, so you can talk about that, and then you can also talk about the place that your organization is based in as well. Um, again, this is really about setting uh, context for the panel about where your organization lives, right? Including, again, geographic features, um, things of that nature that are outlined in the uh, definition for geographic community above as that, and relevant history, as that might be important for the panel to understand. Organizational community, who comprises the audience or communities your organization engages with through your programming and how does it connect to your organization's mission? Include, indicate, sorry, what data sources inform your understanding of who your audiences or communities are. So this is a change to this question. We recognize that it's, it's this is a tricky thing for organizations to define. Um, so we're not requiring demographic information per se. We're not requiring X, Y, and Z. We just wanna know what your sense of who your organizational community is and what's informing that sense of who your organizational community is because that's the only way uh, to understand relevancy right and if you're functioning as a nonprofit in the public good where your 
have a community identified that you're engaging and that they're reflected in your leadership structure, staff, board, et cetera. So after you've defined that, the next question, question seven, is responsiveness to your organizational community and programming. So how are the needs, desires, or identities of your organizational community reflected in your artistic and cultural programming? You can talk about how your organizational community might be, have been included in decision-making processes about your programming. Question eight is similar in character, but it's focusing on operations. So how does the operational decision-making of your organization reflect your organizational community and its needs? And then you're gonna share how your organization and your organizational community work to address a recent challenge or opportunity. This is a change from last year's application where we had a focus on challenge. We want to give people the option to talk about a challenge or an opportunity. It's fine to share something negative. It's fine to share something positive. The interesting thing for a panel to hear is how you work together, right? It's understood that people have been through challenging circumstances in the pandemic or just, you know, running an organization in general for uh, the, the past X amount of years, right? There's enough right there. So kind of choose choose what uh, is your, your best, most interesting story there. Um, you can use for those reapplying, this might be an answer you provided at your last application. Again, that's okay if it feels like it's the best one you have to share. Normally, you know, we consider thing in a three, things in a three-year cycle. Um, for those reapplying, it was a, a one-year grant for you all as this program was reset, right? Okay, question 10, you're going to share uh, support materials within the last year showing how the work of your organization is meaningful to your organizational and geographic communities. These are those community support files, letters of support from uh, individuals in your community, organizations, businesses, um, capturing audience reactions, et cetera, et cetera. I would recommending, recommend using all those slots. I'd also recommend with all support materials you provide, edit, uh, curate them, right? So don't give for the least community support and organizational support a hour video uh, or a 45 page document. Really think about the fact that panelists are reading anywhere between 20 and 30 of these and you want them to get the best sense of your organization as possible with information they can retain in their minds. So, you know, I always say, you know, if you could, you could put more than one letter together in one file and upload it, I wouldn't really go beyond three letters. Uh, in general, I think a good rule of thumb in terms of panelists' ability to ingest things is documents that are no more than two to four pages. Um, when it comes to sharing videos, you can either share something that's three to five minutes, that's a good amount, or if you need to share a larger thing because you can't edit it, because I, well, I, I have my own challenges with that personally, then just simply indicate time points, like start at minute three until minute 10, they'll get it. With all the things, um, when it comes to um, submitting files, um, please either use, you know, Word um, or a PDF. Don't use uh, Mac, you know, numbers or, or notes. Our system can't translate that. We indicate that in the guidelines. When it comes to videos and things of that nature, um, upload it to a third party site like Vimeo or YouTube and just share the link because uh, panelists are going to have challenges downloading videos, right, and viewing them since they do everything through this user interface. All right, your board. So, excuse me really quick. Yeah. How is your board reflective or not reflective of your organizational community and its diversity? If relevant, what efforts is your organization engaging in to ensure that your board is or will be reflective of this organizational community? Uh, and then you're going to share a board and staff demographic grid. Um, the thing to know about the demographic grid is we are only, you're, you're only required to give us demographic information about your board. And we can only ask you about specific categories that are federally defined that you can see there, you know, uh, to agree which board members identify as American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, Black or African American, et cetera. For your organization, depending on your mission and what you do, uh, you might want to talk about different other different kinds of diversity in there, or you might find the categories that we are limited to using are not don't, don't use language that is reflective or, or authentic of your community or your board members. 
So this document is editable. So you can make changes in language as it sees, suits fit to you. And you can add other categories to it. For instance, if you're an organization that is whose focus is, of work is on working with people and communities of people with disabilities, you likely uh, have people with disabilities on your board. Um, you can add that as something in your um, in your demographic spreadsheet. So as you all are doing that, who are applying and reapplying, and you have questions about that, let me know. Okay. Thirteen uh, question thirteen: Diversity in staff, artists, and volunteers. So this is where you discuss how your organization is achieving or addressing diversity amongst your staff, artists, and volunteers and ensures representation from those who are historically and continuously marginalized in your organizational community. We're all in different communities. Some communities are more racially homogenous than others. Certainly when we get to uh, outside of the Northern part of the state, you know, Providence and environs, that's understood. So, uh, but what are you doing to address diversity that is that is within your defined organizational community. So we're going to con we're continually refining this in the panel process, but really trying to ground panelists understanding in that that you know it would be disingenuous for organizations based in communities that are racially homogenous to have representation that is not reflective of that community. So diversity looks different, right? And inclusion looks different in those communities. Uh, so just understand that and have that grounded in how you're answering these questions. And then lastly, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and access. So how is your organization, I needed to reverse those words, I see. How is your organization centering diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in your work? So please share up to three specific actions. For organizations with budgets under a half million, this question is worded slightly different to be a bit uh, broader, understanding that uh, your resources are different and how you might approach that work is different. Um, the DEIA planning document, I believe, I need to go look back at this, is something that I believe is only required for organizations uh, with budgets over a half million dollars. And again, that might be a larger document in this instance, and that's okay. You can certainly direct uh, panels to look at that. This could be a portion of your, st your strategic plan. It could be an explicit DEIA plan. It's just whatever document you have that might refer to this work at your organization. With all these questions, you'll see a recommended ideal response length. I really recommend following that. Don't go overboard. It's always this Goldilocks syndrome, right? When you're writing grants, you know, grants are a very imperfect way to uh, give out uh, money. Um, we can have a whole another discussion about that. Um, but it's like giving the right amount of information for a panel um, that they can understand what's happening and it doesn't overwhelm them and cause them to get confused, whatever. So that's the end of the application proper. That's the information for the panel. The next session section, I'm going to just blow through um, information for risk of staff. Um, these are, again, those eligibility documents. First off, you have to attest that you won't use the money that you might receive for things you can't use it for. These are all restrictions from the federal government. Your board member list I mentioned earlier, your 501c3 determination letter, legal name of your organization, your SAM UEI number, and you believe your organization fits the definition of being BIPOC centered, your 990s, blah, blah, blah. Panels don't look at that. Um, I always orient them. I'm like, don't look at that. Don't, because I don't want them to get burned out, right? Um, that's just stuff I look at, again, for compliance purposes. And then we ask you who your elected official is because for uh, at the federal level, your U.S. representative, because when we do grant award announcements, we reach out to the congressional delegation to let them know prior to making grant awards announcements who received a grant. And then lastly, last information for risk of staff section, for those of you who applied for risk of grants before, these these are those drop down menu questions that are required from the NEA. I always say to everyone, just answer these to the best of your ability and just know that I, I check them, okay? If, if, if there's something wrong or whatever, it's also understandable that you might answer these wrong because they, a lot of these categories are old, right? They're defined, uh, the NEA has its own challenges in changing them for a number of reasons, but one of them is longitudinal data collection purposes. So just do your best and I'll just be there to check you, just know that. And then that's it. So that is it with the application proper. 
I'm going to shut this down and pause recording and then come back up with the remaining slides. Um, as I'm doing that, feel free to formulate questions in your mind and you can unmute and ask them as I'm, I'm transitioning here, okay? And then I'll give you all space to do that as well when we get back to the PowerPoint. All right, so we have walked through the application. Now we're gonna talk about what options you have for support. So first off, you all are ahead of the game. It is the 15th of February, I think, right? This isn't due until April 3rd. You have a month and a half. So what I recommend is if you think you might need support or just want to talk to me about anything you've heard today, sign up for one-on-one -on -one support with me. There's actually not limited slots left because we're pretty early on. Um, a lot of February is getting filled up, but I'm going to send, as I mentioned, a link uh, for signing up to speak with me one-on-one -on -one where you can sign up for a time, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's drop-in hours as well. Let's say you missed the one-on-one -on -one support, or let's say you're like doing the application at the end. Of course, you started it early. I know you all. You're gonna you're gonna heed my advice there. But there's like little tweaky things you're trying to figure out on deadline day, April third, which is a Monday, and then the Friday prior, we have drop-in hours from ten to four p.m. where some risk a staff person will be on Zoom. We're like all lightly uh, cross-trained in our programs enough to answer kind of uh, small questions, right? So someone will be there to help you all. Um, I'll be uh, personing the Zoom the Zoom room as well at different points. And what will happen to if is if you come in there for a question, and my dear friend and colleague Molly Flanagan is in there. Um, if she can't answer it, she might text me or shoot me a quick email and I might pop in there to answer the question or, or text her back a response. Uh, I will have options for grant draft reviews. So if you started your grant application the weekend prior to the deadline, um, I'll be sending an email out in the system to anyone who started that draft to be like, hey, if you want to sign up for a time to talk with me, I'm sorry, sign up for a time for me to review your application and give you feedback, do so on this sign up here. What will happen is you'll sign up for a time for me to review your application in that week leading up to the deadline. You do not need to be present at the time I review that application. Just ignore the time piece. Really what it is is a way for me to organize my own time. I review your application for a half hour and then I'll email you at the end of the day for which the time you signed up for is. Uh, with feedback, all right? And what you can do too is you can sign up for a time when you get the sign up and you can follow up with an email to me and be like, hey, Todd, um, I signed up for a time for you to review our draft grant application. These are the primary questions we have. And I'll focus on those things first and then I'll spend the rest of my time on whatever else. But that way that allows you to focus my half hour in a way that's best for you. As you can imagine, I've gotten really fast at reading things in a way that's actually terrifying because I feel like I can't read an actual full book now, but whatever, we'll talk about that at another point in time. So I, I can go through grant applications pretty quick, focus on those things and then look at the rest of the stuff as well. Lastly, and this will be linked in my follow-up email to you all, <clears throat> There, uh, we have an Arts Administrators of Rhode Island Facebook group that we like to direct people towards. We post about our um, grant opportunities, our workshops, various things we're doing there um, as a way to communicate those things pretty quickly that don't fit in our newsletter. And you can also ask questions of other arts and culture organization folks, people working at them within that Facebook group as well. Lastly, we're getting towards the end. Um, we have a workshop coming up on March 8th from 10 to 1130 AM. It's free and it's via Zoom. We're offering it in partnership with uh, Grant Makers Council of Rhode Island and Arts Equity Rhode Island. Arts Equity is uh, form our former VSA Arts Rhode Island run by Janine Chartier. Um, the New England ADA Center will be presenting on how nonprofits can create access. What are they federally required to do under uh, the disability related legislation like the ADA and 504 to do as a nonprofit, whether or not you receive uh, federal funds, um, and then how to get started doing those things. Uh, you know, we offered some equity and access related workshops last spring. This is going to be our only offering for this spring. Um, but for those of you who get into the general operating support program, newly the cycle, uh, and for those of you who are reapplying, et cetera, there's going to be a few 
uh, access related things that we're going to be uh, weaving into the grant award uh, letter you receive in the grant agreement form. They're very simple, don't freak out. For those of you who are meeting with one-on-one -on -one this spring uh, prior to the application deadline, I'm gonna explain this to you in more depth, but it's gonna be two very simple things. One, identifying an access uh, point person at your organization. And then two, filling out something called a 504 self-evaluation. There's gonna be some of you organizations who have applied for NEA grants before. This is something that you have to have on file when you apply for an NEA grant, so you've done it already. The one that exists that the NEA has, this evaluation's purpose is for you to just basically, you know, think about your organization and, and the kinds of access things you do and don't do. It is not evaluative. The purpose is for you to evaluate yourself and, and be aware of what you're doing and not doing. It's not a part of anything that a panel sees. You will fill out a modified version of that. So the one that exists that the federal government has is like 35 pages long. I'm not having you do that. I've gotten permission and state arts agencies have permission to use something that is modified. So I'm gonna basically make a four to six page Google form that you all will do. You'll put your answers in the Google form. I'll then have a handy dandy spreadsheet that shows everyone's responses. And I and Janine can look at it and be like, okay, here's where we're seeing where people have shared questions about things. Okay, that will inform us as to what programming we should offer and how we can support your accessibility efforts moving forward. Make sense? Making you aware that now you'll get plenty of emails about it from me if you're a grantee in this program uh, for next fiscal year. For the workshop, just going back to that, uh, if you can't attend live, don't worry, recordings can be made available. I said link is in this chat, total lie, I can't put links in the chat right now. So I'm gonna send it in a follow-up email to you all after this workshop session. <gasps> and we're at the end. So that's my email address if you have any questions. Uh, about anything that will be included in the follow-up email as well. So I know this is an action-packed 90 minutes and there's things you're still digest digesting and percolating on. So feel free to continue to digest and percolate and reach out when you are able to. One second, everyone. <laughs>